First of all, I want to thank you all very much. Uh, my name is Majid Mohideen, and I'm going to be speaking on spatially fractionated grid radiation therapy using a brass collimator. I'm very pleased to be invited by the AAMD to give this talk that's being sponsored by Dot Decimal. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, this is a talk that I put together with Harold Park. Harold Park is a physicist here at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital, where I work. I'm a radiation oncologist uh, that's part of Radiation Oncology Consultants. We're a large private practice group here in the Chicago area. And uh, we're about 22 doctors at 15 hospitals. And we have a whole bunch of different modalities available to us, including gamma knife, cyber knife, proton, tomotherapy, HDR. And one of the things I bring to the group is this technique called spatially fractionated grid radiation therapy. Now, a number of you out there probably have never heard of this. So I'm, I'm really excited to give this talk, because this is actually a novel technique, but actually it's very old also. So I'll kind of go through that as well. Um, it's actually the reason I went into radiation oncology. Um, I actually, when I was in medical school, was thinking about becoming a neurosurgeon. And um, my, my one disclosure is that my father is a radiation oncologist who had sort of resurrected this technique, uh, I think almost in the 70s and 80s, and uh, had a patient who was 18 years old. She was in high school. She presented with ovarian cancer, which filled her pelvis uh, and abdomen. She looked like she was seven months pregnant. She was refractory to any chemotherapy. He used this technique on her, and she was able to go to her prom and dance. And when I saw that, I made a complete switch into radiation oncology. So uh, this is a technique that anywhere I've ever gone in, in practice, I've had to bring it with me because I felt like it was a necessary part of my armamentarium in treating uh, certain types of cancers. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with you as well. There are three learning objectives uh, today. Uh, First is to understand the historical perspective on the use of spatially fractionated grid radiation therapy, to understand the physics behind the grid technique, and then also to understand some of the clinical applications of it as well. Um, when I give this talk to physicians, the only other two things I add is a review of the clinical literature, which I'm not going to really do today, and then I get into more of the radiobiology. Why does it really work? So I may touch on that if there's some time. Uh, but I wanted to, to stick to the areas that I thought would interest all of you more. So the history of radiation therapy, briefly, is that Rontgen discovered x-rays in 1895, so around the turn of the century. And within six years, he won the Nobel Prize in physics for it. And in the very beginning, this r radiation was a miracle. They were using it for everything. And very shortly after, in 1902, they started using radiation for treatment of cancer. So 1902 is sort of the beginning of our radiation history. This is a picture of a woman who is getting x-ray radiation of the breast in 1903. So this is a simple x-ray tube. There's no protective housing of the machine whatsoever. The radiation is scattering in a number of different places. This is the basic idea of the early radiation machine. Most of us are familiar with the radiation machine on the right, something which is a modern linear accelerator. But until the 1950s, 60s, even 70s, even though the equipment got a little bit better in terms of protective housing and look, we've been mostly dealing with low energy x-ray machines. So on the left, you have an orthovoltage machine. And that's basically what it looks like. It's, it's a uh, x-ray machine where there's electrons shot from a cathode towards a tungsten target, and the beam comes out in a funnel-shaped distribution, uh, which you can see over here. And so this machine, the, the orthovoltage machine, is applied right against the body of the patient as close as, as possible. The problem with a machine that's orthovoltage or anything less is that it can only deliver radiation of 100 to 400 kVp. And what that means is that you have the maximum dose going to the skin 
with no skin sparing effect. Right. When it comes to skin cancers, this is fantastic. I mean, sometimes we wish we had these machines still for skin cancers. But the problem is, is that most of the dose is going to the skin, and you really can't get any depth of the dose. So if there's poor depth of doses. And so when you're trying to treat a tumor that's deep inside the pelvis or inside the body, you're getting very inadequate doses to these deep-seated tumors. Or if you're trying to get doses there, you're going to have excessively prohibitive skin doses. So even though this was a miracle, when they discovered this in 1902, they quickly discovered that this was going to be a problem. So this is what it looked like in that era. So different machines basically doing the same thing, but there's a funnel-shaped area here that's applied right to the skin in trying to treat something that's deep inside. And this is the best that they had at the time. But very quickly they discovered they had a problem. It was too toxic at the skin. So 1909, so only, with, only seven years after we started using this, in Germany, Alvin Kohler created something called a perforated screen, which he called a sieve, but has also been known as a grid. And the purpose of it was to create an effect similar to treatment with a multitude of small pencil beams. And, and what I like about this is, you know, when you have limited resources, it's amazing how creative you become. So this is sort of what it looked like. This sieve or this grid or basically a perforated screen. And usually it was made of uh, some sort of metal. Later on it became lead and rubber and it was put directly on the patient's skin and then the orthovoltage machine was directly put on top of it. And this was supposed to collimate the radiation dose at the level of the skin. In 1933, Lieberson inadvertently did the same thing. So after experimenting, I think Europe was a little bit ahead of the US in this, in terms of rolling out the technique. But uh, in 1933, he used the same technique, but he called it a grid. And that's where that name sort of came from. And the purpose, again, was to limit damage to the skin and the subcutaneous tissues while treating deep-seated tumors with higher doses. So the grid at that time was made of lead and rubber. And what they did is they cut one centimeter circles into this large area and then tried to divide that area into a ratio of 50% open holes and 50% shielded areas. And this is what it did for you. So this is a graph looking at the amount of dose that you can get into the patient using a grid versus without a grid. So if you were to treat a field size of 10 by 15 centimeters with 200 kV, 50 centimeters target from the skin, an open area of that area would be 3 point, you know, basically 3.3 gray, or 3,350 Ronkin. Okay? That same area, if you used a grid, could actually treat about 24 gray. And what that does to you, does for you is at the surface, you may have a very hot spot of 27.5 gray under the open circle, but the blocked out area will only have about 5 gray. And as you go deeper into the tissue, 5 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters, you're now able to get a dose that you wanted to to the tumor that we're used to, you know, 2 to 3 gray while not really having severe skin side effects. So this is the technique that they use to try to get some sort of dose to deep to 15 centimeters that would actually do something for a tumor while somehow preserving the skin. So in a nutshell, small volumes of tissues were able to tolerate really high doses of the radiation even in excess of 120 gray that could be delivered. But at the same time, the blocked areas of the grid block would protect areas of skin, which were within the treatment area. And then these areas would sort of serve as centers where cells could migrate out into the damaged areas 
and allow regrowth of the normal skin. And using this technique, they went from not being able to treat these tumors to now allowing six times the dose to be given and actually try to treat these tumors. Now, in the modern era, we developed an accelerator guide tube. So we have a waveguide system that's funneled by a magnetron or a klystron, and now we're able to give megavoltage doses of radiation. And these megavoltage doses of radiation allow us to get dose in with good depth profile, with good penetration. So if we look at the range of energies from the 1900s, when radiation was first being used to, you know, about the 1970s is where, you know, these LINACs really started taking off, 60s, 70s. You can see how the energies have completely changed, you know, from looking at 100 to 500 kV in the orthovoltage era to the megavoltage era. And what ended up happening is because we were able to get much better depth penetration with the modern LINAC, the whole concept of using a grid fell out of favor. It wasn't necessary anymore. So the megavoltage x-ray machines that we now use allowed better skin sparing effect, better depth doses, and basically the eventual abandonment of the grid technique. So I would venture that most of the people who are planning, most of the dosimetrists and physicists who are planning really, you know, today, probably don't remember the grid because they weren't using it at that time. But it's a technique that's been around for over 50, 60 years that was used routinely to treat patients. So where does that leave us now? Now that we have a modern linear accelerator, is there any role for improvement? And, and my, my question to you is, you know, how are people in your clinics treating bulky or recurrent tumors when all other treatment options have failed? So this is a patient that was seen, you know, not too long ago who has a very locally advanced head and neck cancer. If you wanted to surgically resect this tumor, you could not. It's unresectable. There's so much blood that's vascularizing this tissue that the patient would die just trying to resect it. If you wanted to treat this with open fields of radiation, it would be a very large field. And the dose that you'd have to give per fraction would have to be pretty low in order for it to not be too toxic. So you're sort of stuck with this problem. And I would venture to say that most people looking at this tumor would either say chemotherapy, which really doesn't have a very good response for this, or basically hospice. There's really not much you can do. But as Winston Churchill once said, sometimes the more you study the past, the further you will go in the future. And so this is where I look at the resurrection of the grid itself. So I want to just present a case that we treated here at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital. This was a 71-year-old Caucasian male who had a patacellular carcinoma that was metastatic to the left scapula. He was diagnosed as stage 4 disease. And you can see this mass, which is wired out here. Um, it's about 10 by 10 centimeters, and it's mostly deep to the tissue. The patient was having severe pain in his left shoulder, 8 out of 10, and he had no real range of motion in his left arm. So the arm was just hanging kind of useless because of this, this mass. So the solution, I would posit to you, is basically taking an old technique known as the grid and marrying it to the modern technology we have now, the modern LINAC, to create a new solution that takes the advantage of the best of both. So this is a block that was custom made and fashioned by dot decibel for us for this patient. And this particular block is made of brass. Why, why is the grid important? So this is a graph looking at tumor killing and how tumor killing is dose dependent. So on the, the y-axis here, we have a tumor of a certain volume. So as we go up this axis, that's a bigger size tumor. And the tumor is implanted as a small size on a mouse and then allowed to grow over time. So this is time going this way. 
And if you don't give any radiation treatment, zero gray, you'll see that the tumor gets big very quickly. If you give some radiation, two gray times 10 fractions, the tumor won't be as big, but it will grow. And if you give something like 10 gray times five fractions, it will regress and it won't grow nearly as fast. So this is intuitive, more dose, higher dose per fraction, less tumor growth, especially for large tumors. I would say that maybe about 15, 20 years ago, if I said we're going to give 10 gray times five fractions, you would say that's crazy, that's too much. But nowadays, we give this fraction routinely all the time, whether it's cyber knife or a stereotactic uh, body radiation. 10 gray times five is not that surprising anymore, even in the lung. And we know that doing that sort of fractionation gives you very impressive results for these small tumors, almost on the, on the same level as surgery. So the trick here is, and, and the problem is, when you see a tumor like I showed you, either on the scapula or on the face, there's no way you can treat that whole tumor with an open field without having major, major skin breakdown and side effects. So that limits you to giving low doses, one, two, maybe three gray. But when you use something like a grid, it allows for skin sparing because it gives you these beamlets of radiation. And then it allows you to use very high doses, almost like SBRT. And at the same time, the modern LINAC still allows for deep beam penetration. So when you put the two together, it, the combination creates high dose beamlets that act like stereotactic virtual brachytherapy. Now, I know I mixed a couple of things there. I got stereotactic and I got brachytherapy. I'll get back to the brachytherapy part, but you can understand that the doses here are definitely stereotactic-like. So if there's one thing I want you to think of when you think of the grid, I want you to think of stereotactic virtual brachytherapy. And I'll get back to that. So let's say you did what we did. We, we basically said we wanted to order this block. This block came to us. It's 25 by 25 centimeters at the ISIS center. Each hole is 1.43 centimeters in diameter. And the, the ISO center from one hole to another hole is 2.11 centimeters. These numbers are all derived from the literature. The grid has gone through many iterations over the years where it's been clinically used. And this is one of the spacing that has been probably the most successful and also the most clinically used. So that's where this arrangement comes from. This block is placed onto an accessory tray. When it's brass, it measures about uh, 34 pounds. There is another block out there which is made of cerebin, which is 48 pounds. So this is a lighter block. That's one of the advantages of this block, uh, which is very important to a lot of the RTTs who are probably not used to lifting blocks anymore now that they have MLCs. Um, water measurements are taken in a tank with an unshielded diode detector, and then there's film and optic measurements that are made in solid water using film and using an OSL. This is what it looks like on FOSS. So this is a light field, and you can see that the center of the, the grid field, the cent center of the axis is straight on, but on the edges, it's diverging. And I want you to sort of look at this diverging beam profile on the right. Okay. As part of the commissioning, which is what Harold did, is there's a number of output factors that need to be calculated using the water tank that's done for a number of different field sizes from 5 by 5 to 25 by 25, measuring the grid dose at D max. And then it's normalized to an open field of 10 by 10 at depth of D max. So this is, this is more of interest to the physicists, but I'm mentioning it because once you order the block, this is sort of what you have to do. And once you've done this, then you're golden. You can treat over and over using the same block. This is what the profile measurements look like, and it's taken with film and in water. The, the, the measurements are done in solid water at depths of D max, 5 and 10 centimeters. So D max in this case is blue, uh, 5 centimeters is in red. 10 centimeters is in green. And what you have to imagine here is, I think this is the skin level. And so the dose here is going to be hottest, closest towards the skin. And as you go down, you're going to get a, a nice peak of dose here under the open hole. And under the blocked areas here, you're not going to get much penetration of dose. So what you create is sort of a peak over here and a valley down here. 
And it's this differential of valley to peak that gives you the effect of the grid, the protection, but also the high dose that you need. And it's done for different depths. Then there's a number of depth dose curves that are done with different field sizes, you know, uh, 5 by 5 up to 25 by 25. And it, this kind of looks like an electron beam, you know, depth dose profile. And I use it very similarly when I ch try to choose the beam that I want to use for the treatment as a physician. So if you remember that picture where I was showing you all the diverging beams that were coming out of the grid, this is sort of what it looks like. And this is looking at it, assuming this is sort of the skin level, and these are the different depths, 5 centimeters, 10 centimeters here, 15 centimeters. You get these high-dose peaks and then these valleys. And it's on the order of anywhere between 100 to 80 percent versus, you know, 20 to 30 percent dose at the valley. And this is where, you know, the dose kind of spreads out at that level. But if I were to take a slice of this, let's say at this level here, and looked at it in the axial plane, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see these islands of very high dose. This is really high dose here. And then you're going to see smaller, less dose here. So this might be like the 50% isodose line. This might be like the 80 or the 100%. And you're going to see this over the whole area. And my question to you is, if you just look at this depth dose profile on the right, what does it remind you of? I know I can't hear you, but I'm hoping somebody's going to say what I'm thinking. It kind of mimics the dose distribution you would obtain with high dose rate brachytherapy. Okay. What you're doing is you're treating small core areas of high dose with surrounding transitional zones of lower dose gradient. And just like in brachytherapy, it's this inhomogeneous dose distribution that is effective for killing the tumor, but also delivers a safe and higher integral dose. And it's spatially fractionated because all these little islands are spread out over a large field. So you can think of this as brachytherapy, or you can even think of this like stereotactic, you know, where you're used to treating maybe a brain met. But instead of treating just one little brain met, now you're treating lots of little, little brain mets over a large area. It's the same idea. So it's dose that's being spread out spatially over a large area. And if you look at that again, on the left is a grid at 10 centimeters depth. So again, you have these sort of high island areas. In blue, this is 70 uh, 70 percent here. And then when you have 30 percent, which is in green, they sort of start to uh, coalesce. And in 10 percent, it starts to coalesce again. And this on the right is, whether it's seeds or high dose rate catheters, it's the same sort of dose distribution type of a prostate patient where you have islands of high dose, whether it's from the seeds or the catheters, and then there's an integral dose that goes all the way around. So you are actually giving something like brachytherapy to this area, but it's non-invasive. There's no catheters. And that's where it's sort of virtual. So what we did for this patient is we did dose determination and MU calculations. We always set up the patient to 100 centimeters SSD. The field that we want to pick is modeled in the treatment planning system to try to figure out the best isocenter and gantry angle field size. And if we need to, we use MLC blocking. Um, we're trying to avoid organs like the spinal cord, the lung, things that we want to try to avoid using the treatment planning system. Measurements are then taken at different points from the skin to selected points in the gross tumor volume. And then we use the percent uh, depth dose data that was already generated to help us figure out what our doses are. So literally what I'll do is I'll see this is the skin, this is where my tumor is over here, I figure out the distance here, I see the back end of the tumor here, I figure out the distance here, and based on that I'll pick an energy and a dose that I want to use for this patient. This is sort of the calculation that's done in order to, uh, to determine the MUs, uh, and I, I'll let you just take a look at that, but there's a, a number of uh, uh, output factors that are calculated uh, and done prior to treatment. And so the standard calculation at the University of Maryland, where I was before, we just had a standard sheet with the certain output factors based on the sizes. And just like anything else, you would just plug it in and, before you did your calculation. So for this patient that I described to you with the, uh, the lesion of the scapula, we gave 20 gray 
in one fraction using a 10 mV photon beam. The dose was prescribed to Dmax, um, and we had selected this beam angle based on the treatment planning system. So this is what it does. You've ordered the grid block, you've commissioned it now, and now you're going to treat this patient. So you slide the grid block into the machine, you set it up to 100 SSD, you verify the light field, and this is what those little holes look like. Now, this is coming in an oblique, so some of those circles are going to look a little bit oblong, oval shape, but that's okay. And you can see here, you know, is the area of flash. You're going to take an open film just to verify your ISO center, and then you're going to slide the block in again just to make sure that it's covering that area. And then the nice thing about this block is that you can use the MLCs to shape what you really want to treat. So there's no reason to treat the whole 25 by 25 field. So here we've blocked out a lot of the block over here and are just treating the area of interest in here. So you can shape this beam to whatever you want using the MLCs in your machine. This is the patient five days later. And yes, they have a little bit of erythema. So you can see some of the redness that's on this bump. And within five days, his pain went from 8 out of 10 to 5 out of 10. So already seeing some difference. And this is that area here that we, that we treated. It doesn't quite overlie the, the hump only because different positioning when they're lying down and the arms up. Two weeks later, this is what the area looked like. Um, now, just to let you know, we gave this one big dose of radiation, and then we followed this bump with some regular radiation treatment. Uh, of a certain fractionation. I think it was about 30 gray in total. And what that does is the grid gives a sort of big oomph shot that sort of induces this to start shrinking. And what the regular radiation does is it sort of gives like a maintenance dose afterwards to ensure that it will stay away. Um, you're seeing some erythema here. And I only point this out. This erythema is not the usual. Usually you don't see much of anything. This little spot, this circle over here, is an electron patch of 30 gray and 10 fractions that we're giving. Most people don't get erythema that badly with something of that nature. We think that the patient had some chemotherapy before that made them exquisitely skin sensitive so that the radiation was showing up. That's really useful for me to give you a talk, but I don't want you to think that clinically you see this sort of erythema every time. It's not as usual. The patient at six weeks, no pain at all. And the mass is still there, but it's definitely smaller, and the skin reaction is gone. Has full range of motion now. This fellow was a construction worker, and at the time he was helping his brother or his son build his house. So he is now using a hammer, helping his son, lifting doors, lifting windows within six weeks. Full range of motion. The mass is sort of shrinking. This is four and a half months. And you really can't see anything. The mass is mostly all gone. There's no skin side effects. This is him again at seven months. He's a little thinner here because of other disease. So he did become cachectic because he had liver involvement. But as far as his back and the scapula area is concerned, really no mass that's left behind. So you really can't see that bump anymore. So this is a patient that we treated just, you know, I just saw him a month ago. So again, this is the mass that you see up top. The patient is prone in this position. Now in the supine position, you still see the modeled area of the bone where the tumor was eating the bone, but you really don't see any mass anymore. So mostly all gone within seven months, although clinically feeling improvement within one to two weeks. All right, so some people are going to ask, what can you treat with the grid? You can basically treat all types of tumors at all sites. So this is one of the papers that came out early looking at almost uh, 350 patients. There have been over 500, I would almost say 1,000 patients that have been treated with GRID in the literature, uh, and they're from all different sites. And I'm going to show you some pictures of some of those treatments. Again, this is a sarcoma of the leg. And I just wanted you to look at the, the dose profiles. This is, if you put the GRID dose profiles into the treatment planning system, you can have these very nice looking pictures that really give you a true sense of what you're doing. But this is another 20 gray, and it looks like brachytherapy. I mean, these are almost like you laid interstitial catheters into this large tumor without actually invasively puncturing the patient. 
On the left, you have a squamous cell carcinoma. Very, very nasty. You know, we gave it grid. We gave it some follow-up radiation to that smaller area as well, and this is what they look like after the treatment on the right. So very dramatic results that you can get for squamous cell. This is recurrent melanoma. Melanoma, as you know, is very radio resistant, very tough to treat. So this is the area that was wired out. You can see the large tumor that's here in the axilla. This is pre-treatment. This is after treatment. You really don't see much of anything at all in this area. So most of this tumor is all gone. Clinically, the patient has done very well. Recurrent large cell lymphoma, pre-treatment. This is all disease. You can't even see the carotid or the external vessels here, the external jugular. This is pre-treatment. This is post-treatment. The anatomy is pretty much returned to normal. You can see that the arteries are all well preserved. Uh, the patient is doing well. This is what they look like on the skin. So they look completely normal. Another patient, metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. A very large, nasty tumor on the neck. You can kind of see how big this tumor is over here. This was also treated with GRID and then with some regular radiation there afterwards. This is the acute side effects at the end of the treatment. You know, this looks terrible, but I would I would suggest that, you know, a lot of head and neck cancers look like this. It doesn't look any worse than any other head and neck cancer sometimes. But this is another patient that did very well. You can see that it's completely regressed. This is a very dramatic case. This is a malignant fibrohistosarcoma, retroperitoneal. These are very, very tough tumors. This is a tumor that you can see here that's encasing all of the vessels, encasing the renal veins. This is completely unresectable. There's no way to touch this, you know? So all you can give is 50 gray because it's in the pelvis and this bowel. That's really not enough to treat this. So we gave 18 gray of the grid to this area and also then gave 50 gray. And this is in 2005, and we just followed the patient because there's nothing that we could really do. And now this is 2006, a year later. So sometimes you have to be patient, but a year later, that tumor is all gone. So this is at the same level. The kidneys are both working. You know, the, the cortex is well perfused, and all the arteries are looking very normal here. The patient had a complete response. So these are patients that if you treat them the regular way, you really don't have much of a prayer, whether with chemo or, you know, surgery was not an option. But if you use the grid and you marry it with the normal modern Linux, sometimes you're able to offer a patient a solution, you know, that they wouldn't otherwise have. There's another typical. This is more palliative, but this is a recurrent rectal uh, and anal cancer that's on the buttocks. This was treated with grid and regular radiation following it, and you have uh, a pretty good acute response. So this is by the end of the treatment. So usually we do the grid first, and then the very next day we start with radiation. I didn't review the literature, but when they've looked at giving radiation afterwards, if you give it at least 40 gray or more after you've given the grid, then you have a good durable response. You can give the grid by itself and you can get a very good response, but if you give extra radiation afterwards, the chance of it staying away is better. I want to briefly talk about multi-leaf collimation-based grid. So you don't need to have a grid block in order to give the grid treatment. However, I would suggest if you're going to do this in your clinic, it's worth it to get the grid block, and I'll explain. At the University of Maryland, we were treating with a grid block, and then from uh, 2005, we started using multi-leaf collimated grids. So we were simulating the grid holes using our MLCs, which means that any Linux that has an MLC can technically do grid treatment. So this is a paper that our, we wrote up and basically said that the experience with the MLCs and the regular grid block are very similar in terms of their clinical efficacy. But what you're doing here is you're using the MLCs to try to treat a large area, but you're doing it in strips. So the blue is the first treatment, the green is the second strip of treatment, the yellow the next, et cetera, and you're trying to cover that whole area using interlocking strips of the MLCs to replicate these grid holes. This is me in the left corner. This is a, the patient I saw when I was at the University of Maryland. This is uh, a really locally advanced breast cancer. And what you're looking at there is, is or was the nipple is completely all necrotic dead tissue. There's this peau d'orange that you can see on the skin here. 
this is all tumor. The patient is in pain. The patient can't eat because the smell is overwhelming. You cannot resect this. It's too big. You can't really give chemo because this is not really a vascular tumor. So there's no blood vessels to deliver the chemotherapy to this. So really not many options. So what we did is we used a grid. In this case, this was an MLC-based grid. And you can kind of see you basically have you know, some MLCs that go this way, and then you have some that are blocked this way, and you have other ones that come in this way. So they're sort of pass pointing. This ones are going this way. These guys are coming up to here. And in this way, you sort of replicate the grid. Now, the open to closed area is not exactly 50, 50 like I had with the other grid. But still, it can be done. So this is like the first strip, then we treat, let's say, the middle strip, then we would treat the next strip, et cetera, all the way down to the chest wall. So this is not that patient, but this is what those holes would look like. It's a little blurry, but it's sort of these square holes that kind of mimic the circular holes on the skin. In the treatment planning system, you can see how this looks like, I, you know, stereotactic, or it looks kind of like high dose rate brachytherapy. We laid these catheters across this tumor. And you can see it in the axial, sagittal, and coronal plane. So this whole area that's in red here is the GTV that was being treated with a beam coming this way, uh, treating through and through this tumor. And this is sort of on FOSS. You see these circles of beam. And this was given 20 gray. Three months later, this is the scout film on the CT scan. And what the radiologist, who didn't know the history, said is there has been an interval mastectomy. But the truth of the matter is there was no surgery at all. So you can see on the right, you can't see the breast. This is before. So this is the tumor in red with the, the grid lines. This is afterwards. So this is pretty much a relatively normal looking chest wall now on the right side. And this is what that patient looked like after treatment. So they received the grid. We did follow it up with another 50 gray of regular radiation using regular tangent fields. And this is what it looked like. And so what you see here, all this white is just a silvadine healing cream. But otherwise, this, this is healed very, very well. There's no smell. The patient has good range of motion again. We were able to, to help this patient. All right. So let's say you decided that you've seen a patient that looks similar to this. You, you've decided to yank on your physician's white coat and say, look, I know this is a little bit outside of dogma. I know you might not have seen this, but maybe you should give this a shot. You decide to order the grid block from dot decimal. It comes to you. You've now commissioned it, sort of like I've explained. You're, you need to plan this. So these are some of the guidelines for beam design. You always use 100 SSD, and you prescribe the DMAX. The physician can help you decide what, what energy to use, whether 6 or 18, based on where depth they want to get to for the tumor. You don't need to add any margin to the GTV. I generally add about a centimeter or so, but you don't need to. I mean, even if you cover the whole GTV, you're really only treating half the tumor because half of it's blocked and half of it's open. I want to cover as much of it as I possibly can, but even if I'm missing some, that's OK. You try to spare some of the normal tissues especially the bone marrow producing bones. You want to avoid critical tissues like the spinal cord. I usually put a margin on that of a centimeter and don't treat anywhere near that. Brachial plexus, uh, things of the carotid, things of that nature. And then you can use any energy that you want to use. This is an example um, of a grid treatment for palliative liver, uh, liver mass. Uh, this is from the University of Maryland. And I borrowed these slides from Martha Ahrens, who's a dosimetrist there, who has done a lot of the grid treatments there. So um, um, she's done a lot of these planning uh, pictures and, and uh, dose plans. But what you can do with this is you can come and attack the same tumor from different angles. So you've got one strip that's coming in this way, but then you've got another strip that's coming, coming in at a different angle this way. Then you've got a third strip that's coming at a different angle this way. And there, if you look at them in profile, you've got sort of different beam, you know, different catheters going in different directions, so to speak. The spinal cord is over here, so you can see that they've blocked this area here. You know, the spinal cord is over here, so there's no beams going at it at that level. The kidney is over here, so we're trying to stay away from the kidney in this area. So you're just trying to find different beam angles that can cover the area in the best way. Also paying attention to where the exit dose is going to be. 
So again, if you looked at this on a DRR fashion, you can see that these are the beams in this strip, and we're staying off the kidney here. We're staying off the spinal cord here, and we're staying off the kidney here, coming at a different angle. And this one, we're trying to stay off the spinal cord centrally, but we're treating on this side and this side of the tumor. And over here, again, staying off the spinal cord, coming at all different angles. So you can, you can get a little fancy with the grid, too, to try to cover this area. This is sort of what this looks like on the skin. There was a case report that was handed out uh, that you can refer to. And I'll just kind of show you it very briefly. But this is an elderly lady who was 80 years old who had a large sarcoma of their arm. They were supposed to get an arm amputation. The radiation oncologist said, let's do pre-op first. Let's just try and see what we could do. So this lady had this large sarcoma over here. She started getting an open field of radiation that was similar to this in this picture over here. She got six gray. And within six gray, the tumor was bigger than the light field. It was growing on treatment. In fact, it was growing so fast that there was little tongues and uh, fingers that were growing out of the tumor. So in panic, they sent the patient to me. I did a grid treatment of uh, 18 gray to this area. And what I did with this field is, you can see here's the bone here. So we put a centimeter on it, and we blocked out the bone. Now, the, the GTV here in green is wrapping around the bone. And over here, even though it's wrapping around the bone, we did not treat this area near the bone. We treated everything else. So we didn't treat everything. We tried to protect the bone. Now, we had a sort of mix-up with our surgeon. The surgeon knows that the pre-op dose that we give for sarcoma is 50 gray. Well, we gave 18 gray with the grid. I still would have given 50 gray. I kind of discount the grid dose, believe it or not. You don't really worry about it. You just give your regular radiation. But he insisted, no, I will not do surgery. So we were forced to give only 32 gray. And if you know anything about sarcoma, 32 gray is not going to do anything by itself. But this is what happened. On the top is the MR. And you can see the tumors here wrapping around the bone. The bone is this here. So this is the pre-op treatment. And you can see this is the sarcoma here. And after the grid of 18 gray and 32 gray, which is not enough, this is what it looked like now. It was just post-op residual. And this is where the tumor was now. And it shrunk away from the bone, even though we didn't treat the area near the bone with the grid. The picture up top is pre-surgery. So this is radiation alone. So the tumor is pretty much all gone just before surgery. They did do a flap to cover the defect. There was 99% death of the tumor. And the tumor was at least a centimeter away from the bone pathologically, which means that it had regressed. So there was a tumor killing effect, even though it wasn't directly under the radiation field of the grid. So there's something that works throughout the whole tumor, even if you're only treating part of it. So what the grid lets you do is it allows you to kill several logs of tumor cells. It probably allows for better reoxygenation, especially when you give your regular radiation afterwards. So it's sort of a good priming dose, a good induction dose that kind of gets things moving in the right direction. And then you give your regular radiation afterwards. And I think there's some sort of bystander effect where there's something about the cells that get hit that said, I'm going to die, we're all going to die. And then it tells the tumor cells around it that are under the closed block that never got the radiation saying, hey, you know what, we're all jumping ship. We should all commit suicide. And they do via apoptosis. And so there's an effect even though those areas are not treated. So there's a number of cytokines, TNF-alpha, TRAIL, and other cytokines that are induced from the open areas in the closed areas. And I'll just briefly touch on, I think, the effect that you're seeing with the grid. So under the open areas here that actually get the radiation dose, they elute out cytokines into the blocked areas that cause cell killing. I almost feel like this is like an endogenously created local chemotherapy that the big grid dose creates in the body. It's probably immunological. But it allows those areas that were blocked out to actually respond. And at the same time, at the level of the skin, these areas of skin here that were, did not get radiation then migrate into the, the hurt areas, and they allow healing. And there's actually a number of studies that show that that is true. Uh, when you have a serious injury, that normal tissue migrates into that area. And I think that there's different responses to high doses of radiation, of 15 gray or 20 gray, 
whether it's tumor or blood vessels or soft tissue, they all respond differently, but together they, they actually help create this effect. There's a couple of slides on biology, which in the interest of time, I think I'm going to forego, unless somebody's really dying uh, for me to go through them. But it does touch upon this idea of this abscopal effect, that the radiation that we think is local really has distant effects that you, uh, you know, that kind of go against dogma. But really, at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. You know, clinically, what do we see? What have we done? What have we treated? And do you see the results? So I'm going to skip this area here. Um, and just sort of conclude now. Basically, when you take a grid, which is a technique which we've used over 50 years in the, in the era when we had no other option, but we used it a lot, and you use it with modern technology of a LINAC, you can actually create a solution when conventional treatments are not feasible or not really effective. And it's particularly effective for extremely large, bulky, and advanced tumors, where we really don't know what to do. Using a grid is a published technique. There's a number of papers that are out there on it. There's over 500 patients that have been treated on it. You don't need a protocol or anything to treat it. We treat people in the clinic all the time with it. You can give 15, 18, 20 gray in a single treatment using the grid. It's just one single beam you know, uh, coming from one angle. And then it works best for consolidation if you consolidate with at least 40 gray afterwards you know, literally starting the very next day. And, you know, the way this has worked for me is I've had patients just sent to me for the one grid treatment, and I send them back to their other center for their regular radiation. So it's actually been very effective, very helpful for other radiation oncologists in the area, you know, now that we have it commissioned here at Lutheran or any, any place that I've been, actually. Again, I just want to come back to this one picture. You can see the beams coming out of the grid up at the top left and the beam angles. You can see it going through the tumor here. I just want you to think of this as stereotactic brachy. We're sort of taking ideas of brachy, which we know are very, very effective, high dose, inhomogeneous dose distribution that kills tumor, and we're taking the idea of stereotactic, you know, knowing where exactly you're treating, picking your beam angles, giving high dose to small areas. We're doing the same thing, except we're taking those small areas and we're spacing them out spatially, that's why it's called spatially fractionated, over a large area. So we're giving the idea of a, like little stereotactic treatment to a large area. And that's what helps it regress. Last couple of slides. Why order something like a brass grid collimator? So first of all, even though you can use MLC grid and you can use it on any machine, I actually think it's much faster and easier to just have the block. Instead of having to treat strips, which means you're basically treating five sort of grids in a row, you can just treat one major strip. And that's a lot faster. Uh, when you have a patient who's in a lot of pain, who can't set up, it's, it's really very, very convenient for everybody to just be able to treat them quicker with a block. It also means less monitor units as compared to doing the strips. There's other blocks out there. There's another CeraBin block. The brass block works just as well. It has the same valley to peak profile as the CeraBin block. It's 14 pounds lighter, so it's a little bit easier to lift, especially when you have RTTs who are not used to lifting anymore. So it's a bit of a safety issue to the patient and staff. Um, I'll be honest, you know, the color is very pretty. Even the patients comment on it. It just has a very artistic, aesthetic, appealing look to it as well. The block is compatible with any linear accelerator, so you can slide to any sort of linear accelerator. They can, they can customize it for you. It's a one-time purchase, and it can be used again and again and again. You shape the field based on your MLCs, so it's very cost-effective. And once you have it, you'll be using it more often than, than you think. So again, I just wanted to thank you for patiently listening to this talk uh, and sort of looking at this novel but yet also old approach. And um, I wanted to thank uh, the AMD for allowing me to speak and Dot Decimal for sponsoring this, this discussion. All right, you've got a number of questions for you. If you want to pull out the, your question box on the toolbar. They go, they start about a minute, 1 hour 23. Uh, where are the questions? 
questions. Here we go. Uh, oops. 